You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, a special series on the book of Revelation, which we're calling The Catholic Apocalypse. And today we look at Revelation chapter 18, The Fall of Babylon the Great. Howdy, and thank you for listening to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. And last week we saw the great whore of Babylon, the adulterous spouse of God, ancient Israel, who had rejected the Messiah. And today we see the fall and destruction of that great city. All right, well, welcome back to the Taylor Marshall Show. We have a great program for you today as we move to Revelation chapter 18. And remember, there's not much left in the book of Revelation. We are almost finished with our full study. Revelation, as you probably know, has 22 chapters in it. So we are definitely on the final lap here. Today we're going to look at the fall of Babylon and the vivid language in which St. John describes the destruction of of this great city over the face of the earth. This is the covenantal city. It is the sacramental Old Testament place of God's presence there at the temple in the permanent tabernacle of the Old Covenant. But before we get into the book of Revelation, I want to share with you our proverb of the week and also the announcements for this week. And the first big announcement is that we are going to have two pilgrimages in 2016. That's right, two pilgrimages. These are going to be uh, sponsored by the new St. Thomas Institute, and they're going to be educational pilgrimages. We're not just going to go to all the sacred sites, see the relics, go to the famous uh, churches. Along the way, I'll be teaching classes on what we are seeing. So the first pilgrimage is one to Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City, And the second one is to Rome and Shrines of Italy. So the first one is to Our Lady of Guadalupe. She is the patroness of the New St. Thomas Institute and the star of the new evangelization. I went last year to see Our Lady of Guadalupe, and it was one of the most moving experiences of my life. I saw the Shroud of Turin last year. I was in Rome last year. Uh, I went to Mass with the Pope. I went to Benediction with the Pope. But seeing Our Lady of Guadalupe in person was the most moving experience that I had. And I want to share that with you. So I'm going to invite you to come along with me and with joy. And we're going to go down for a short pilgrimage to Mexico City. We're going to see Our Lady of Guadalupe. We're going to go up on Tepeyac Hill. We're going to see the old basilica. We're going to see the new basilica. And we're going to do a couple bonus things like uh, go out and see the location where St. Michael the Archangel appeared to Diego Lazaro in 1631, and a a well sprung up. So you'll be able to get that holy water that comes up from that well just outside of Mexico City. But most of all, you're going to be able to spend a lot of time just sitting there or kneeling before the tilma of Juan Diego with the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. If you want to learn more about that and see some of the things that you're going to see, If you go over to uh, taylormarshall.com, I put up a video, or you can go to pilgrimages.com. This is probably the better thing to do. Go to pilgrimages.com forward slash Taylor Marshall, and you can click on the Guadalupe pilgrimage, and there's a video in there that I've made that shows you everything we're going to see and why Our Lady of Guadalupe is so important for our time. Probably even more important than all this is your question, is it safe? Is going to Mexico safe? I was very worried about going to Mexico but we've partnered with 206 Tours, and we have professional buses and tour guides and translators and clean food and clean water and the best hotels. All of our transportation is taken care of. You will be 100% safe. I'm taking my wife, maybe even my newborn child, maybe some even of my own children. That's how confident I am. So if you want to go to Guadalupe, this is the safe trip. And also I'll be teaching some classes. I'll be teaching a class on the history of Guadalupe. I'll teach a class on Marian mediation. I'll be teaching a class while we're there on the history of Marian dogma and also a class on how to explain the Blessed Virgin Mary to Protestants. So all those classes and this pilgrimage and all the holy sites. That's Guadalupe. That's going to be February 4th through the 9th, 2016. February 4th through the 9th, 2016. 
But then the big pilgrimage for 2016 with the New St. Thomas Institute. And by the way, you don't have to be a, a active member or a student at New St. Thomas Institute. Anyone can come with us. However, those who are members of New St. Thomas Institute uh, do receive a discounted rate. The second pilgrimage is Rome, the eternal city, shrines of Italy. And this is June 26th through July 5th, 2016. So if you want to take advantage of some of your vacation days and also take advantage of the 4th of July holiday and get over to Italy and go to Rome and have an audience with the Holy Father, the Pope, and see all the major basilicas and go to the catacombs and get this, we're going to go on a day trip and go see Padre Pio at San Giovanni Rotundo. We're going to go to Loretto and see the Holy House in Loretto. We're going to go to Assisi and see the tombs, the relics of St. Clair and St. Francis. And we're going to go to Lanciano, which has the famous Eucharistic miracle. We're going to see the Pieta, St. Peter's Basilica, St. Paul, St. Mary Major, Lateran Basilica, all oh, the Vatican Museums, the Sistine Chapel. And along the way, I'm also going to be teaching a mini class based on my book, The Eternal City, as we're traveling around and learning. We'll have priests for you. We'll have masses every day. We'll have confessions. This is going to be a spiritual retreat, a pilgrimage, and an educational opportunity. So the pricing is great. This is a great deal. Please head over to pilgrimages.com forward slash my name, Taylor Marshall, pilgrimages.com forward slash Taylor Marshall, and come with me. During the day, we'll be eating together. We'll be talking theology. We'll be telling jokes. We'll be having a great time in the eternal city, of course, with translators. So you don't have to worry about any of that while you're there. So check it out, pilgrimages.com forward slash Taylor Marshall. And I hope to be with you in Italy and in Guadalupe in Mexico in 2016. Okay. Our proverb of the day is Proverbs 21 verse 17. It goes like this quote, he who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. End quote. So in our typical Hebrew parallelism, we have two levels. The first level talks about a rich man. I'm sorry, it talks about a poor man. And then the second part talks about being rich. And in the first part, it says that those who love pleasure will be poor. Pleasure is seeking of pleasure is the opposite of temperance, which is one of the four cardinal virtues. So sometimes in our life, actually probably every day, we have to say no to things that would give us pleasure. Um, you know, you could eat all kinds of things that would give you pleasure, but you're going to become unhealthy. You'll gain weight. You'll clog your arteries. Not good. You know, from what I hear, injecting heroin into your arm feels amazing. It's one of the best uh, ex uh, experiences that I've been told that you can experience. Heroin addicts will tell you that, but it's not good for you and it makes you poor. It introduces you to the cycle of addiction. And I think that's what it's talking about here in Proverbs. If you're always seeking pleasure, if you're addicted to pleasure, it will rob you not only of your finances, but of your happiness. And then secondly, it says, whoever loves wine and oil will not be rich. And in the old days, wine and oil signified luxuries. Some people struggle just to have bread and water to survive in a house. So to have oil, which was medicinal and also made your hair shine, your face shine, it, it helped with cracking hands and cracking feet and skin maladies and all kinds of things. And also wa uh, wine, which not only tasted great, but also made you feel well and also was something key to entertaining other people. If you had those things, you were living a life of luxury. So if we set our hearts on those things and the luxuries in our lives could be luxury automobiles, luxury homes, luxury vacations, luxury uh, status symbols. If we set our hearts on those things, we will not be rich. And I think in a twofold way, one we will max out credit cards. We'll go into debt. That always brings about poverty. Debt is evil in the Bible. And also we will become spiritually poor. Our hearts will be set on materialism, physical things. And as we're going to see in today's lesson from revelation 18, that is not the path of sanctity, and ultimately, it's not the path of joy, peace, and happiness. Some of the most unhappy people 
today and in the history of the world were the richest people who had their hearts set on the latest luxury. So there it is, Proverbs 21, verse 17. And let's jump in now to our Catholic apocalypse, Revelation chapter 18. Well, you'll recall in the previous episode, we looked at the great whore of Babylon, the prostitute who had given herself to the adulterous nations of the world. And she had been pledged to God in the Old Testament. She had been the chosen bride, the chosen people. And instead, she turned to idols, and she put her trust and her faith in the kings of the nations, the idolaters, the pagans. And as a result, we saw that she gave over the true religion of of the one true God and instead worshipped Caesar. As the high priest said when he was trying Christ, we have no king but Caesar. So we see the city of Jerusalem transformed. Instead of being the bride of God and the bride of Christ, she's turned into a harlot. And she has aligned herself or coupled herself by riding upon the beast, the sea beast, which we identified in chapter 13 as the Roman Empire. And she is going to experience judgment. And we saw the judgment that she was going to experience in last week in 17. And this week, and by the way, if you haven't listened to the previous episode on Revelation chapter 17, I would encourage you to do so. The 17 and 18, today's chapter, go together. It's the same idea. And of course, you can listen to today's show and understand it all. But I think listening to 17 and 18 together is ideal. So, You might want to pause this and listen to the previous episode, chapter 17, before moving on to 18. So I broke up chapter 18 into three sections. The first section is verses 1 through 8, and then the next section is 9 through 20, and then the last section is short. It's verses 20 through 24, and I'm going to handle this chapter in those three chunks as we move along, just in case you have your Bible next to you and you're following along. So I'll Read the first section, and then we'll go line by line and comment on it. So chapter 18, this is the fall of Babylon. Verse 1, quote, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his splendor. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul spirit a haunt of every foul and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of her impure passion, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich with the wealth of her wantonness. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For the sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her as she herself has rendered, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double draft for her in the chalice she has mixed. As she glorified herself and played the wanton, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, A queen I sit, I am no widow, mourning I shall never see. So shall her plagues come in a single day, pestilence and mourning, and famine, and she shall be burned with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. End quote. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's the opening eight verses of Revelation chapter 18. And let's go through line by line and see what's going on here. So it begins with another mighty angel. And we've seen in previous chapters that we've moved along that sometimes St. John describes what seems to be Christ with the term in Greek, angelos, which we translate into English as angel. And this does not mean that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is an angel. He's not. He's greater than all the angels. He's eternal. He's consubstantial with the Father, as we say in the Nicene Creed. He is much greater on a metaphysical level than any angel could be, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1. But here, this angel, once again, this messenger, the Greek word angelos means messenger, not necessarily an angel. 
Here, this messenger seems to be similar to God himself or to Christ. He has great authority, which reminds us of what we learn about Christ in John chapter 5 and John chapter 10. He comes down from heaven, but most of all, it says the earth was illumined with his glory. And this is language we see all over John's gospel. Of course, this is the same John in the book of Revelation. John chapter 1 speaks of the glory of Christ uh, three or four times. John chapter 8, John chapter 9, the gospel of John chapter 11, chapter 12, so on and so forth. But also this is pulling from Ezekiel chapter 43, where it says that with God, the earth shines with his glory. So the language that's used for this angel seems almost divine, if not divine itself. So there may be a reason here to think of this messenger coming as the Logos himself. He's coming to bring judgment. And we hear it shouted aloud, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. So this is echoing Amos, the prophet Amos, who said the same thing about Israel centuries later. Amos in chapter 5 writes, She, that is Israel, she has fallen and will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. So Israel, as we learn from Amos, is supposed to be a virgin. But she's exchanged her virginity and she's become a prostitute. She's become the whore of Babylon. And so, as it says here in Amos, she has fallen We see the same language here in Revelation. Jerusalem, Israel, is a prostitute. She's no longer a virgin, and she is fallen. And she's given the name Babylon. Babylon was the original great enemy of Israel and Jerusalem. Of course, destroyed Jerusalem in 587 and and destroyed the temple and, and brought them into captivity. But what's interesting here is that it's become a dwelling place of demons and of unclean spirits and of unclean birds. Now, in the Greek here, we have the word for dwelling place as katoiketerion. And this word is used elsewhere to describe God's presence in the holy city, in the temple. That's right, in the temple. But notice it's not God that dwells in the temple anymore. It has become a dwelling place of demons and unclean spirits and every unclean and hateful bird. This is a great judgment upon the holy city. And Christ himself said that the house of God, the temple of God, would be made desolate. For more on that, read Matthew chapter 24. In the third verse, we read about how she's committed fornication with nations, kings, and merchants. So instead of being faithful to God and trusting in him, Jerusalem has turned towards other nations and kings, namely the Romans, and also merchants. Israel desires the luxuries. We're going to see that in the in this chapter, and it relates to our proverb of the week. She loves the wine and the oil. She wants to be rich. She wants to be like the emperors and the Caesars of the pagans. And it reminds us of Jesus Christ when he came to the temple in Matthew 21 and also in John chapter 2, and he drives out the money changers. This is an indictment on the temple. He says, you have made my father's house into a house of merchandise, a den of thieves. So Christ is condemning how the temple is becoming a place of commerce a place for merchants. And we see that here in in Revelation 18, chapter 3. So it's not only a judgment because they love and commit fornication and adultery with kings, political, but it's also economic. They're doing it with merchants as well. In chapter 4, we have this um, call for salvation, a call for rescue. And the voice from heaven says, Come out of her, my people that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive her plagues. Come out of her. This is Christ when he told them in Matthew 24 to leave Jerusalem 
when they saw the sign of the eagles surrounding the city. What are the eagles? Those are the Roman standards that the Roman legions carried before their armies. When the Roman eagles surrounded the city in A.D. 69 and into 70, that was the time for the Christians, the followers of Jesus Christ, to leave the city. And we know that that, in fact, did happen historically. The Christians, following the prophecy of Christ, left the city. So this is saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not receive her sins and her plagues. This, by the way, is one reason why we know that the great city being discussed here is not Rome, but Jerusalem, because there was never any instruction for Christians to leave Rome. In fact, there was instructions for Christians to go to Rome. Christ told Paul to go to Rome. Christ indicated for Peter to go and to stay in Rome. So Christ is telling people to stay in Rome, but he's saying get out of Jerusalem. That's another hint for us, showing us that this city is in fact Jerusalem. And it says that her sins have piled up to heaven. This, of course, refers to what our Lord Jesus Christ talked about, about filling up the measure of their guilt, and how he, in Matthew 23, spoke of all the righteous blood shed upon the land by those who were hypocrites, the scribes, the Pharisees, the high priests, those who pretend to serve God, but are in fact enemies of God. And for this reason, it says, pay her back even as she is paid, give her back double according to her deeds in the chalice which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. So she's going to get a double dose of her own medicine. She is going to be doubly punished. And this probably refers to how she has sinned not only against God, but against mankind. And we see throughout this passage that her sins and her adultery affect not only her relationship with God, but her relationship with the covenantal people and her relationship with the pagan nations. And so she's being punished. She's being chastised doubly. Then it says that she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and not as a widow, and I will never see mourning. So she is boasting. She thinks that she's secure. She thinks that nothing can bring her down. And this is actually a reference to Isaiah chapter 47. In Isaiah chapter 47, uh, Isaiah speaks of the condemnation of historical Babylon. And there it reads, You said, I shall be queen forever. These things you did not consider, nor remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. See, there it is. See, so Isaiah is talking about Babylon, the pagan nation, who says, you know, I'm a queen. I'm not a widow. I'm not mourning. And Isaiah says, no, God is going to visit you, and you will be punished. So just as God once published, pun, pardon me, punished the ancient Babylonians, now he is punishing Jerusalem, who has become a spiritual Babylon who has denied the presence of God there at the temple, denied the presence of God standing before them in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully men. And now they have become a haunt of demons. They become a habitation for that which is unclean. goes on to read, For this reason in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire. For mighty is the Lord who judges her. So he says it's going to all happen right away, in a day, in a moment. The entire city will be destroyed. It will be burned up with fire. And that's exactly what happened in the year A.D. 70. Rome came, they destroyed the city, they sacked the city, they killed everyone, they burned the city, and yes, they even burned the temple. So that's the first part of Revelation 18. Let's move into the second part of Revelation 18, beginning at verse 9 and running down to about verse 20. Quote, And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and were wanton with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear and and torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. In one hour has your judgment come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, 
jewels and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, all articles of ivory, all articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. We'll pause right there. So here we have a big catalog of all the items that will no longer be traded in her streets. And this has raised some commentators to say, well, you know, this sounds like a really rich and important city. Uh, is this Jerusalem? Did Jerusalem truly have this much wealth? Was Jerusalem a mercantile economic capital? And the answer is, you bet it was. Uh, Jerusalem was situated between three continents. Jerusalem is on the trading routes moving from Egypt and Africa up into the Middle East, up into Assyria and Babylon and Persia. The roads from China also jump in there through Arabia, runs up through there, and then also into Europe. So all the trading routes sort of meet up there around Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was an extremely rich city. And I want to read a quote from you from a scholar named Alfred Edersheim. And Edersheim reports this, quote, In the streets and lanes everything might be purchased in Jerusalem, the production of Palestine or imported from foreign lands, the rarest articles from the remotest parts, exquisitely shaped, curiously designed, and jeweled cups, rings, and other workmanship of precious metals, glass, silks, fine linen, woolen stuff, purple, and costly hangings, perfumes, ointments, as precious as gold, articles of food and drink from foreign lands, in short, whatever India, Persia, Arabia, Media, Egypt, Italy, Greece, and even the far-off lands of the Gentiles yielded, they might be had at these markets. Ancient Jewish writings enable us to identify no fewer than 118 different articles imported from foreign lands, covering more than even modern luxury has devised." End quote. So Jerusalem is rich. Jerusalem is a trading center in the ancient world, and by it being destroyed and taken out, it brought about a economic crisis. And so we see in this passage where it says, Alas, alas, you great city, the mighty Babylon, in one hour your judgment has come. We see the merchants and the kings, so we see a political and an economic mourning in this great catalog. And many of these items listed here mirror the items listed in Edersheim's list as well. Cattle, sheep, jewelry, spices, incense, myrrh, frankincense, um, linen, purple, silk, scarlet, all these dyes. So it's gone. It's taken out. And this, in fact, did happen in A.D. 70. Now we pick up in verse 14. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and all your splendor are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. In one hour all this wealth has been laid waste. All the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all those whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads, and they wept and mourned, and crying out said, Alas, alas, the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. In one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, O saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her end quote. Okay, so we have more lamentation. We have uh, these men, they're throwing dust on their heads, they're weeping, they're crying out, they're saying you've been laid waste, the wealth is gone, but the key to it all is in verse 20, where it says, rejoice over her, O heaven. So those on earth and those on the sea, and by the way, Jerusalem did have a seaport, not close by, but it was not far off, 
and Jerusalem was part of the Mediterranean Sea trade. Israel, as you remember, is a Mediterranean nation. They are right there in the Mediterranean, just like Carthage and Greece and Italy. So they're part of the seafaring mercantile community. But in verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, O saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Ask yourself, at this time, had Rome killed any Jewish prophets? No, of course not. Had Jerusalem killed Jewish prophets, Israelite prophets? You bet Jerusalem has. Christ even judges Jerusalem for having killed the prophets. And also we know that Jerusalem had killed apostles and killed saints. Now, it is true that Rome killed the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul. That's true. But Jerusalem had also killed apostles. Namely, it had killed uh, James the Greater and then later James of Jerusalem and then many saints, for example, St. Stephen. So it seems here, and it's just so convincing to me that we're talking here about not Rome, we're talking about Jerusalem. And of course, Jerusalem has aligned herself with Rome. We have the whore of Babylon, Jerusalem, and she's riding on the back of the sea beast, Rome. So they are united. They are in common purpose. But here we're seeing the destruction of a certain city, and that certain city is, in fact, Jerusalem. And now we move into our third part. You can see that this chapter is short. It's brief. It, it deals primarily with the destruction of this great whore of Babylon, which was set up in 17. That's why I said earlier in this podcast, I'd really like you to read, listen to the seven, chapter 17 show before moving into this chapter 18 show. But in verse 21, it reads, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. So, is this the same angel as before? It might be. Um, it seems to be the mighty angel that we saw before at the beginning of the chapter. Is it Christ? Is this angel not really an angel, but in fact a messenger in the Greek? Perhaps it takes the great millstone and throws it into the sea. Now, this is, of course, reminding us of that message of Jesus Christ who said it's better for someone to have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown in the sea than to let them tempt or to let them lead little ones into sin. That's a teaching of Christ himself. Here we have an entire city being judged, figuratively tied to a millstone and thrown into the city. I'm sorry, not into the city, into the sea, because this city, Jerusalem, has led the little ones into sin. This city, which was supposed to lead all nations to love God and to worship God, has now led all of them to reject the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so a great millstone is cast into the sea. This is also a reference to the book of Exodus, where we have the Song of Moses, and it goes like this. Then they went down, that is the Egyptians, into the depths like a stone. Thou didst blow with the wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. We find the same thing, the same idea of a stone being cast into the sea as a form of judgment in Nehemiah, where we read in chapter 9, So they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground, that is, the Israelites, and their pursuers, that's the Egyptians, thou didst hurl into the depths like a stone into the raging waters, end quote. So we see this idea of a giant stone or a millstone being cast into the sea as a chastisement, as a punishment given against the enemies of God. What's notable here is that the comparison is made with Egypt. And we saw in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it spoke of the city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. So here we have a direct uh, identification with Egypt as the city where the Lord was crucified. Well, where was the Lord crucified? Was he crucified in Egypt? No. Was he crucified in Sodom? No. Was he crucified in Rome? No. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So we see Jerusalem taking on the identity of these evil pagan cities that persecuted the people of God. Why? Because Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the landing pad for the Messiah, is now turning its back on Christ and persecuting not only Christ, 
but his church, his saints, St. Stephen, St. James, St. James the First Bishop of Jerusalem, etc. Now there's a curious thing here in this section where it says that the city, this holy great city, will not be found any longer. So you might say to me, well, Taylor, I'm pretty sure Jerusalem still exists. I mean, it's on the map. I've seen pictures of it. Um, how can that be the case if the Bible says that Jerusalem will be found no longer? Well, here it's speaking spiritually. Clearly, the geographical location is not going to way, going to go away. However, it's sacramental, it's covenantal, it's redemptive significance for the face of the earth is in fact gone. It is holy because Christ was crucified and he rose again from there and the Holy Sepulchre is there and Pentecost happened there, but it's no longer holy in terms of the old covenant. The place that it, that it held as the location for where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, that's Jerusalem, the place where King David brought the Ark of the Covenant, where King Solomon built the temple, that significance for those dispensations in redemptive history, in the redemptive economy, are goners. They're gone. And this is what it means. It's the great city. It's holy city. It's found no longer. It's no longer a holy city because of the Mosaic or Davidic covenant. It's gone. From a redemptive point of view, there is nothing redemptive about Jerusalem. Yes, we can make pilgrimages there. We can pray there. We can go to Mass. Right, We can recall the great acts of the prophets and of the kings like David and Solomon and the king of kings, Jesus Christ. But there's nothing redemptive about Jerusalem per se. We, as Christians, are not required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We're not like Muslims in that way. We don't have to go to Mecca or any place like that. In fact, as Christians, we believe wherever there is an altar and wherever there is a tabernacle, Jesus Christ is. God himself is present right there. So we don't need to travel far away. We can just travel to our local parish, our local altar, our local tabernacle. And we find this to be the case because Revelation 18 ends on a liturgical note. A lot of people miss this when they read Revelation 18. But if you read it carefully, you'll see that the cessation of certain occupations in the city actually refer to to a cultic or liturgical Jewish ceremony. So uh, beginning at verse 21, it says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So shall Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and shall be found no more. We've covered that. And then it says, And the sound of harpists and minstrels of flute players and trumpeters shall be heard in you no more. That's the first one. Secondly, and craftsmen of any craft shall be heard in you no more. That's the second one. Here comes the third one. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard in you no more. And then the fourth one. And the light of a lamp shall shine in you no more. And then number five. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard in you no more. For the merchants were the great men of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. End quote. So, There's five things that are going to be heard or seen no more in Jerusalem, and all of these are liturgical. Did you hear it? As you were listening, did you make the connection? If you're a reader of the Old Testament, you would have heard it right away. First of all, the music. The sound of harps, minstrels, flute players, and trumpeters will be heard no more. This is describing the liturgical music at the temple that was instituted by David. Remember, we Catholics, um, we love the Psalms. The Psalms are integral to our worship. And the word psalm actually comes from a Greek word meaning to pluck a string. So psalms are songs that are supposed to be sung to the accompaniment of music. And David instituted a Levitical symphony, like an orchestra there in Jerusalem, so that the liturgical music would be beautiful. We all love beautiful sacred music, and King David did. He wrote music. He himself was a musician. Remember, he played music for his previous master, King Saul, and then he celebrated with music at the temple, and he wanted the liturgy of the temple to be glorious, not only with a temple, but to have these beautiful 
hymns and musical arrangements and lyrics. So he wrote the lyrics, and you can, if you, as you read through the Psalms, you'll see that he arranged these Psalms to be set to music. And the music that was used at the temple included harps and minstrels and flutes, and also the trumpets were used by the Levites to sound out holy days and sacrifices with the liturgical calendar. So it's saying no more will the liturgical music of Israel be heard in Jerusalem. It's come to an end. Number two, the craftsmen of any craft shall no longer be found in you anymore. And this refers to the craftsmen who built the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, and then later who built the actual temple. So these would be guys like Bezalel and Oholiab, and then Hiram, who you know helped with building the temple. Craftsmen are related to the temple. And these craftsmen weren't just skilled guys. We read in Exodus 31 that God sent the Holy Spirit, which is a big deal in the Old Testament, upon certain men so that they could be inspired as they built things for the Old Testament temple. So they weren't just craftsmen like handymen. They were inspired by God, not to write Scripture, but to create liturgical, sacred artifacts. They will no longer be present in Jerusalem. Number three, the sound of the millstone will be heard no more. In a recent Ox Talk in the New St. Thomas Institute, I talked about the importance of the temple site in Jerusalem was built on a threshing floor um, by a Jebusite. And King David made a deal with that Jebusite, and that Jebusite even offered to provide the livestock for the sacrifice for the inauguration of that site for the temple. So the temple was built on a threshing uh, floor where a millstone would have been. And this is important because the millstone is where things are ground up. Wheat is ground up. And the grinding of wheat is seen as a sacrificial act in the Old Testament. In fact, there were what's called cereal offerings in the Old Testament where grain uh, flour was offered to God as a sacrifice. We see this especially in the Todah sacrifice, which is translated into Greek as the, drumroll please, Eucharist sacrifice in the Old Testament, which of course becomes perfected and transformed in the New Testament as the Eucharistic sacrifice of the bread and wine, which is transubstantiated into the body and blood of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. Number four, it says that the lamp will shine in you no more. What is this referring to? Well, inside the temple was a sacred menorah, and it burned to remind the Jews that the presence of God burned there in the temple. And so no law, after AD 70, that lamp has not burned inside the temple or in Jerusalem ever since. So the lamp has been taken away. And then number five, this is the most important, the bridegroom. And the bride will be heard no more. It says, And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard in you no more. What's the voice of the bridegroom and the bride? Well, the bridegroom is God himself. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the bride is Jerusalem. As we've seen so many times, especially in the last episode in Revelation 17, Jerusalem is the pure, holy, beautiful, virgin bride of God. She's been consecrated and set apart by God to be his precious, beautiful spouse. And she's turned against him and become the prostitute, the whore of Babylon. And so no more will we hear the voice of the bridegroom God and the voice of the bride, Israel, Jerusalem, speaking back and forth in a loving discourse. It's over. Jerusalem is no longer the location for that reality. Instead, as we're going to see in the chapters to come, there is a renewed bride, a renewed virgin, a renewed Israel called Ecclesia, the church. The church is the new Israel. She is the new Jerusalem from on high. And she will guide the peoples of the earth, the nations, the Gentiles, and even the Jews into a loving relationship, a spousal relationship, a wedding supper of the Lamb for all these people. It's a new Jerusalem. 
So with these five things that are taken away from Jerusalem, we've come to the last verse in Revelation 18, and we'll close with that today. Verse 24, the last verse in Revelation 18 reads, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the land, here meaning the promised land. So in her, that is Jerusalem, is the death of the prophets, of course. The prophets weren't killed in in uh, Jerusalem, they were. I mean, sorry, the prophets weren't killed in Rome, they were killed in Jerusalem. And the apostles, the saints, the early saints, killed in Jerusalem as, as well. And this is the final condemnation. She's been destroyed. In Revelation 19, we're going to see the rejoicing in heaven. A giant party breaks out in heaven because finally the apostate bride of God, the apostate bride of Christ, has been taken out has been removed as of A.D. 70. And there's a big party, and finally we see the bridegroom coming, and he's riding on a white horse. And he's going to go ahead and defeat the beast and bring about peace, renewal, the new covenant to bring in the Gentiles. He's going to issue a thousand-year reign, the millennium. There's been a lot of confusion, especially in Protestant circles, about the millennium, the thousand-year reign that we see uh, inaugurated in Revelation chapter 20. So, We're going to do those in the next couple episodes, and then we're going to finish up our series on the book of Revelation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I have certainly learned a ton. Uh, Last week, I started reading the prophet Ezekiel. Again, I've read it several times. I'm reading it again because I've I've realized reading through the book of Revelation this time, I've always seen the importance of Daniel in the book of Revelation, but this, this study has shown me that Ezekiel especially is influential in the imagery of the apocalypse. So I've, I've enjoyed getting back into Ezekiel and, and seeing all that's there. And hopefully my studies have been helping you to work through the book of Revelation and see it through entirely new eyes. I think, you know, if you take anything away from these book of Revelation series, I want you to take away this. You cannot understand the apocalypse. You cannot understand the book of Revelation without drinking deeply from the Jewish Old Testament prophets. If you've never read Ezekiel, and hopefully, if you haven't read Ezekiel, hopefully I've been able to bring those elements of Ezekiel into this study so you understand. If you've never read Daniel, if you've never read Isaiah, and if you don't know the story of Exodus, if you don't know about the Babylonian captivity, reading the Apocalypse, reading the book of Revelation is basically futile. You're going to be confused and you're not going to understand it at all. So hopefully this podcast series has helped you see how the Old Testament breaks the code. It unlocks the secret of the book of Revelation. All of these symbols and all of these apocalyptic things that you're seeing have already been said before in the Old Testament. And so when we understand the Old Testament, we apply it to the book of Revelation we really begin to understand the importance of the new covenant, how ancient Israel and Jerusalem have become apostate, even to use the the horrifying language of becoming a whore, a prostitute, or as I said in the last podcast, and it's even painful for me to say this, to become a spiritual slut to the nations, and how the Catholic Church comes as a new bride in a new Jerusalem, and how we as Catholics need to be excited about being parts of the a part of the church and how we must defend the catholic church and how we must honor our saints because our saints are what show us that the church in heaven truly is a virgin truly is pure truly does submit to the word of jesus christ so we'll close up there this week i'm going to give a shout out to the comment of the week to the rating of the week and it comes from someone who leaves his name as uh, Uncle Tuna, if I got that right, Uncle Tuna. And he writes, this is on iTunes, in the review section on iTunes. He writes, I consider Taylor to be one of the great apologists of our time, intelligent, charismatic, concise, and funny. His podcasts are A number one, like the steak sauce. I recommend him to everyone who seeks truth. uh, Uncle Tuna, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that and you receive the shout-out of the week. I would ask you if you've enjoyed this podcast, especially the Revelation podcast, if you would 
please, pretty please leave me a rating and review over in iTunes. Uh, go into iTunes and search Taylor Marshall Catholic Show. And by leaving a review there, you uh, allow other people to find this podcast. There's a lot of Christian podcasts. There's a lot of Catholic podcasts. If you think this is one of the better ones and you want to help people find it in Apple iTunes, the best thing you can do is go in there and leave a review. So go into iTunes, go into the iTunes store. This is a free podcast, but you still have to go into iTunes store, search Taylor Marshall Catholic Show, and then click on the tab Ratings and Reviews. And you can leave a one-star, two-star, three-star, four-star, five-star, whatever you think this podcast is worth, and leave a review there. And I will give you a shout-out here on the podcast. And if you have a really good one, like Uncle Tuna, I will read it aloud on the show. So thanks again for listening. Thanks for studying the book of Revelation. God is pleased with you that you want to learn more about his word, that you want to learn more about this unveiling, this apocalypse, this revelation that he's given. And until next time, remember that Jesus Christ has said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. And hey, if you want to go on pilgrimage, Our Lady Guadalupe, Rome, Italy, check it out. Pilgrimages.com forward slash Taylor Marshall. was brought to you by the new St. Thomas Institute. Discover online Catholic classes and earn your certificate in Catholic theology at the new St. Thomas Institute. To register for online Catholic classes, please visit newsaintthomas.com. That's newsaintthomas.com.